the existence of a monopoly doesn't make the benevolent dictator very happy. What the monopolist does is it decreases the size of the pie relative to what you would see if it was a competitively structured market. Remember what we're doing here. We're establishing how markets work to handle the resource allocation problem for society. Okay, somebody's got to decide who gets what because we don't have enough to go around. The market system makes that decision. But sometimes markets might fail. They might not find the best of all outcome. Our competitive market was great. It actually found what we call the socially optimal output, the output that maximized the size of the pie. Again, you might not like who gets what share of that, but society can come back later with a sharp knife and cut the pie up in different ways. We just want to have, unambiguously, we're happier with a bigger pie than a smaller pie. Well, that's what a monopolist does, is it makes a smaller pie. Because the monopolist is out to basically feather its own bed, not so much interested in the size of the pie. And so what we're going to talk about now is what happens when uh, governments uh, decide to intervene in the case of monopoly and, and maybe, make some, maybe make some changes. And one form of intervention, perhaps the one that's most popular at the press, is antitrust laws. Okay? Antitrust laws are laws that Congress passed to try to prohibit certain activities, certain outcomes, certain behaviors that firms might, uh, might find themselves in a position to pull off. The most important antitrust act was the first one, Sherman Act of 1890. The Sherman Act has several sections to it. We're going to talk about two in this course because they're the two major sections. Uh, section one deals with price fixing. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about firms who collude. Sherman Act Section 1 makes it illegal for you to collude. We call it price fixing in the United States, and you go to jail for that. Uh, Sherman Act Section 2 makes monopolization illegal. Okay? So the Sherman Act Section 2 was put in place with the benevolent dictator in mind. To say, hey, look, this monopolist is constraining the size of the pie. Now, the monopolist is better off for it, but Congress is representing all of us. And they're passing a law that says, you know what, we're going to get rid of that and get that pie back up to be big. So we have these monopolization cases. And the monopolization cases are long involved processes. Okay? Uh, and part of the reason they're long and involved is they have multiple parts. The first part is you need to establish the existence of the monopoly. Now, it's been pretty easy in this course. I just put Q. Q is the product. Okay? It's some sort of generic product. Sometimes I say oil, sometimes I use. Uh, mayonnaise, sometimes we talk about corn, but when you get into a court of law, it's sort of a different thing. So for example, in the past, in this country, the Department of Justice, which is the chief enforcement officer for the antitrust laws, the Department of Justice would go after, say, an industry, a firm that might have, let's say, 90% of the market share in the production of glass jars, and say, that is a monopoly. Well, when they get to court, the first thing they have to do is establish the existence of the monopoly. Now, no one would question 90%. That's enough market share that you could act like a monopolist. But the real question is, is the market glass jars? And so you could argue, mm, as in this case the defendant did, no. The market's actually containers. Firms can use glass jars. They can use tin cans. They can use plastic jugs. They can use aluminum. There's all sorts of things they can use to contain products, milk, food, lima beans, all sorts of stuff. They don't have to put them in glass jars. And in fact, the court bought that and said, yeah, you're right. And when you look at the container market, those glass jars are a relatively small percent. The case gets thrown out before you even get to the second part. But if in the first part you can establish the existence of a monopoly, uh, 1911, Standard Oil, one of the biggest cases in antitrust monopoly history. Oil is a pretty generic product. And John D. Rockefeller and the Rockefeller family owned, they basically controlled the entire oil market at the turn of the century. This case happened in 1911. And in that case of 1911, the Supreme Court established something that we still hold in place today called the rule of reason. And the rule of reason says, hey, listen, First, you've got to tell me it's a monopoly, and then you've got to tell me, a.k.a. also known as a bad monopoly. And as the Supreme Court is wont to do, in their opinion, they have lots of footnotes and a lot of references and, and these sorts of things. They say, listen, if you read that case, it's actually got a lot of interesting things. That the American system is built with this sort of story that says if you build a better mousetrap, 
people will be the path to your door. Well, that's what we want people to do is to make a better product. But the logic of this is if you make such a really good product that everybody wants yours and nobody else, how can we punish you for that? Okay, so they established something that in those, in that, in that, uh, when they gave their opinion, called skill foresight and industry clause. The skill foresight and industry said, if you got your monopoly because of skill or foresight or industry, which in those days meant hard work, we're not going to take it away from you. Okay? That monopoly is yours. You earned it. You've built it yourself. And so in the past, products that have companies who have gone to pretty negative findings at lower court levels in antitrust monopolization cases like Kodak were able to, upon appeal, argue the skill, foresight, and industry clause and say, we can't help it that everybody wants to buy Kodak film. It's your kid's first birthday party. You stop and buy Larry's fly-by-night film on the way home. The pictures turn out bad. There's never going to be another first birthday party. So people will buy our product, and we've spent 60 years building, high, uh, building the image that we have high-quality stuff. That's an argument the court will buy. Monopolization, we tried to a while back. There was a monopoly case against uh, Microsoft for the operating system. And uh, eventually the government decided to just drop the case because it became clear that Microsoft's argument that the fact that uh, they had the dominant marketing operating system, not because they were doing anything evil, it was just that people latched onto that and wrote software for it. And as more people wrote software for that, it became a thing that more people wanted to have that sort of standard platform. And that sort of grew into this, uh, into this creature. So, Monopolization cases have this rule of reason. When we move down the road a bit and talk about collusion, we'll talk about price fixing, and, and we'll find that they don't have the rule of reason in that. I want to talk about one more government intervention. And when we did the monopoly, when we introduced monopoly, we talked about something called a natural monopoly. And a natural monopoly, our definition was, it's a situation where one firm can produce a product more cheaply than two or more firms. You say, well, how's that technology work, Larry? Well, I'm going to give you just a very simple example. We're using uppercase Q here because this is the market. Uh, it's also the firm because right now it's a natural monopoly, so the firm is the only firm in the game. So you could use lowercase Q or uppercase Q, but we'll think about uppercase Q because I want you to think about a situation where the whole market could be met by one person at lower cost than having two or three, four, two, three or four firms. Imagine you had a product where almost all of the costs, and for a moment just humor me and say all of the costs were fixed costs. Everything was upfront fixed costs except for a small little variable cost. Well, that means that your average cost curve would be going down forever, right? Because if we remember, put one of those little, you know, those little dream worlds that pop up over cartoon characters' heads. When we did cost curves, we thought about the fact that for the individual firm, there was an average fixed cost curve, which asymptotically vanished. There was an average variable cost curve. And then the total cost curve was the sum of those two, average total cost. Well, if, in fact, the majority of your costs, and for a moment, if you humor, humor me, let's say almost all of them are just fixed cost, then your average cost curve just keeps going down. Well, in industries like that, that means we'd rather have just one firm laying out the fixed cost in advance and have everybody become a member of that firm. Because the more people who become members, the per person membership fee, that is the cost per person, drops. So, I've used this example before. If you were making a long distance phone call in this country back in the, in the 70s, that long distance phone call would go through what? AT&T. AT&T had a monopoly. Why? Well, it was a natural monopoly. We had gigantic fixed cost to put a phone system down. Copper everywhere. If you want to make a phone call to somebody in California, it had to go on copper. If you want to make a phone call to an ant up in Maine, it had to go on copper. If you want to make a phone call down to somebody in Key West, it had to go on copper. Okay. And so rather than have everybody lay copper out, we let one company put all the copper out. And the more people who became members of that, that is, the more people who used their services, the lower the average cost became because everybody was all getting more the burden, they were sharing the burden of that big pile of copper on more people. Natural monopolies are situations where the government will give you that monopoly. The water company, the power company. AT&T used to have it for telephone. 
but then they regulate them. Here in Illinois, uh, obviously now what happened in, in this industry was technology changed. Uh, as after, uh, after the uh, Vietnam War, we understood the power of microwave communications. People could set up microwave towers. There was a famous case, MCI case, where there's a microwave tower set up in Chicago and another one down in St. Louis. Local calls were free in those days. For those of you who don't know the history, local call was free. Long distance cost money. Well, you could take an ad in the Chicago, they took an ad in the Chicago Tribune and say, just call this local number and punch these series of numbers in for a phone you want to reach in St. Louis. We'll take it up, send it electronically to St. Louis. They'll put a pie tin on a tower down there, catch it, drop it down into the bed of copper in St. Louis, free call out to your aunt. And so they had a way to, cir to circumvent AT&T's long distance charges by just using the local at both ends. Now that was made AT&T very mad. They took the people to court and said, Your Honor, we have this opportunity, we have this right. And then the government said, Yeah, well, you do up till now, but I think something's a, there's a, something a little different wind here. I think it's time to change. And so they took away AT&T's natural monopoly status and opened it up to all those people who interfere with you at night and call you and say, How would you like to change your long distance carrier or your cell phone carrier and all these things that we have these days? This type of regulated utility is still in existence uh, here in Illinois and in all 50 states. The last mile, in other words, the, the production of electricity is no longer regulated, but the transmission of electricity into your house is regulated, and the rates that that uh, local company here in, in, in Champaign, it's called Amron, um, there's uh, something in Illinois, the Illinois Commerce Commission meets uh, once or twice a year and listens to rate hearings where the firm will uh, petition to raise their rates from 7.1 kilowatt, 7 .7 cents per kilowatt hour to 7.4 because, oh, our costs are going up and all this. And they'll make a decision on it because they've given them a monopoly for technology reasons. That doesn't mean they're going to let them have free reign on price and shrink the pie.